Hey, welcome back to part three of our webinar on contextualizing and interpreting storytelling, otherwise known as eating story, uh, just like Ezekiel ate the scroll that God gave him. Uh, so, so far we started out, oh, my name is Dante Stack. I'm the director of outreach at Faith Ascent. Um, part one, we looked at defining what a worldview is. And we essentially came to the conclusion that it is two parts. It is a narrative plus perceived facts. We wrap those together and that's our worldview. Then we looked at story itself. We saw that story usually can be broken down pretty easily into three acts or a three act structure. The Bible, however, doesn't fit too snugly or the biblical stories, biblical narratives don't fit too snugly into a three act structure. Most of the time, we kind of see a four-act structure at play. Uh, in part two, we took a look at what Christian storytelling should do, could do, would do, um, as opposed to our secular friends' version versions of telling stories. Um, but overall, all good storytelling validates our existence and validates the suffering and pain that we go through before it can reach its conclusion. Uh, we looked at MacGuffins as well. That's that device that the characters care for more than everybody else. And kind of along those lines, we talked about how Christians should avoid easy solutions and avoid MacGuffins themselves. My recommendation was that Christian storytelling should focus more on faith, hope, and love as the end game, rather than achieving some goal like salvation. This last part of our webinar now, we're going to take the time to see how faith, hope, and love fit into story genres. Uh, we're going to talk about how genres also are used to, uh, to input heresies into our narratives. So we pick up heretical thoughts a lot of times subtly or under the surface unconsciously from the stories we consistently digest and intake. And lastly, this time we're going to talk a little bit more, I know we've talked about it a lot already, but even more about the concept of happily ever after and what that means in the big sense for us as Christians. So let's start there. Um, so again, this part three is how contextualizing the story can reform our narrative lens. So we're going to use genre with kind of the faith, hope, and love aspects and what we've already picked up in parts one and two of this webinar to reform how we view other narratives, other stories that we're watching, and how we can maybe reform the stories we're telling. All right, so think about eternity. What mental image do you have? What, what do you think of when you think of eternity? Many of you uh, will think of, you know, the classic, I don't know really where it came from, the classic concept of all of us just like floating on clouds and playing harps and maybe looking like babies kind of <laughs> with wings, um, angelic beings. Um, but what do you actually do for all of eternity? What's it look like? Uh, here's a screenshot from uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven, which is a terrifying story. I, I can't say I really like it because uh, it's, it's terrifying. Um, but here uh, in the screenshot, the dog goes to heaven for a little bit. And it's very similar to that classical idea of sleeping on clouds, not doing anything. Um, and the concept really is... Like, okay, after, like, the niceness of it, once you realize, like, okay, this is a nice place, it's boring. Um, eternity, the way we know it, at least the way our cultural zeitgeist has taught us to think about eternity, is boring. In the long run, I don't just want to be playing a harp for millions and billions and if years of for never-ending time. I don't want to just be chilling out on a harp sitting on a cloud like i, I kind of want some variation in my existence over time um so this impacts us on a lot of layers 
Um, I don't know if we can really uh, unpack this without having a conversation with just me monologuing. Only so far we can take this thought, but story itself is built on trials and tribulations, right? We talked about that before. It's built on validating our experience, which is mostly painful, or maybe not mostly, but has a lot of pain in it. Uh, so Dante's Divine Comedy, not me, Dante, but the Italian writer Dante, uh, in his story, he goes through, he's given a tour of hell, purgatory, and heaven. Um, but nowadays, what does anyone talk about when they talk about Dante? They only talk about Inferno. They only talk about Dante's hell. Why? Because there's, there's more going on. There's more conflict. Ultimately, there's only conflict in hell. And so that's more captivating to us. It enthralls our imagination because our imagination can do more things with that conflict than it can, uh, especially the heaven scenes. So like that right there, that, that written book that's 600 years old or almost 600 years old now, we throw away two thirds of it in popular culture and just hold on to the hellish portion. At Barnes & Noble, Dante's Inferno cells singularly apart from the rest of the Divine Comedy. Because paradise just isn't that interesting, at least from a storytelling standpoint. Um, even what we're given in Revelation, right? We read this quote before. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anywhere, for the former things have passed away. Okay, so what are we doing? Uh, Andy Warhol, the painter, um, artist of, what, 60s and 70s? Uh, he made a movie called Empire. At the time, it was the longest movie ever made, I believe. It was like eight hours long. And it was a static shot, just a camera mounted, uh, looking at the Empire State Building. Nothing changes. But he, they actually showed this movie in movie theaters. You can imagine people walked out because it was quite boring. Um, so we don't have, we, we can't like really come up with an idea of heaven that isn't boring. Um, heaven on tape is not a story we really are interested in telling. Unless you change it up and add conflict to heaven, but then is it heaven? It doesn't really seem like it. Um, the truth is, eternity with God is going to be akin to the Trinity. Um, the Trinity is kind of translogical, right? God in three persons, three in one. Um, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around that concept of the Trinity. In the same way, I think, eternity is impossible for us to wrap our minds around. One, we can't really imagine time just going, 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 and never having an end. But second of all, we can't really fathom story that doesn't have conflict or pain in it. Because story <laughs> is... Precip uh, precipitated or, or completely confined by the existence of pain and conflict. You can't have one without the other. Um, so eternity with God actually is an unfathomable thing, uh, just as the Trinity and Jesus being 100% God and man are also unfathomable things. But it's my conviction because... Uh, God is amazing. It's my conviction that there will be story in heaven. We just don't have the ability really to fathom to fathom it or to conceive of it this side of paradise. So all this is to say I was kind of hard on Christian films and Christian filmmaking in the last part. And this part, as I show you a picture of the character named Trinity from the Matrix movies, um, that we should give grace to our brothers and sisters who are trying to tell stories. Um, 
especially ones where they're trying to have a happy ending. Because genuinely, genuinely happy, uh, genuinely happy stories with happy endings are difficult to make. It's just, it's difficult. So always have grace um, when you're watching a movie or TV show and understand that the maker of it isn't perfect and they're going to get a lot of things wrong um, about the reality of this world. And if they're trying to create a happily ever after, they're going to get that wrong somehow because we don't have the ability to comprehend that happily ever after. Uh, I just found this uh, quote from Aaron Sorkin. He is the creator of shows like The West Wing. Um, he said this during one of his master classes. He said, if you make the audience groan, I can tell you, it's hard to get them back. The first thing I want to know, in fact, the only thing I want to know, is what is comprehensible. Did the audience follow the story? If you put confusion into the mix, even the tiniest bit of confusion, the audience is going to be apprehensive. An audience needs to feel when they sit down in that chair that the storyteller has them by the hand and is leading them through the story. This is a very interesting quote and segues into what we want to talk about next. So we talked all about story is pain, story is conflict, story is ah, all these bad things. But at the same time, story needs to not be confusing. Story needs to be comforting. So how do you have stories with pain that are also comforting? I think the solution is genre. Um, we've had now thousands of years of storytelling under our belt. And we've learned some things. And we've come up with some consistent themes. And these themes help create genres for us. Um, and you can see here... There's a whole litany of genres, and there's subgenres upon subgenres, and we'll talk about a few in a moment. Um, but check out Merriam-Webster's definition. Uh, genre, as you might guess from the way it sounds, comes straight from French. Genre. Uh, a language based on Latin. It's closely related to genus. And I wanted, I wanted to share that, um, because genus, obviously, is a word we know from biology. Um, and genus, obviously, is how we categorize animals into subsections. So genre is our way of categorizing different types of stories. Both words contain the genre root because they indicate that everything in a particular category belongs to the same family and thus has the same origins. So the main genres of classical music would include symphonies, sonatas, and opera, and the main genres of literature would include novels, short stories, poetry, and drama. But within the categories of novels, we could also say that detective novels, sci-fi novels, romance novels, and young adult novels are separate genres. So we keep sub creating sub-genres and sub-categories, further and further isolating each story into a family of stories. Why is this important? Because once we intuit what the category is, we can start feeling comfortable that we kind of know the layout of the land. We kind of know where the story's taking us. Uh, and once we know that, like, oh, this is a comedy, I'm supposed to laugh. Once we know that I, we're supposed to laugh, then we feel uh, a freedom to laugh and we feel comfort. Um, The general idea of genre is that when we see it, or hear it, or read it, we know what to expect. Take Shakespeare. Take Romeo and Juliet. Here is how Romeo and Juliet begins. This is the first words that Shakespeare wrote, the very beginning of Act 1, Scene 1 of Romeo and Juliet. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life. At the very beginning of Romeo and Juliet, we know the ending. He just told us the ending. The two main characters in Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet, are going to commit suicide. 
spoiler alert, Shakespeare. Nowadays, we would kind of feel like, whoa, 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 what are you doing? That you're, you're breaking the third act already. That's supposed to be the big reveal at the end. That's why I'm here, is to get the conclusion that I wasn't expecting. But especially back then, 500 years ago, with plays, theaters, tragedies, you told the audience up front, hey, this is a tragedy. It's going to end really badly. Set your expectations. So we don't always do it so upfrontly nowadays with our movies, but genre still is very um, impactful on how we ingest uh, movies and literature nowadays. Uh, all right, so just to give you probably the most um, explicit example of genre uh, in the modern age is the genre of film noir. Now, film noir... Uh, we don't, we don't have a ton of them anymore, and really you could even characterize any movie that's trying to be a film noir nowadays as neo-film noir. But film noir had its heydays from the 30s to the 50s, and they had dozens of things that almost every film noir had to have. They always had an investigator, a criminal, uh, a bad yet beautiful woman, the femme fatale, right? And then... A second woman that's good but also bland. Um, they almost always took place in Europe and they had the background of World War II or scummy parts of Europe in mind. Um, there's always some sort of money laundering or stolen thing that there is part of the investigation. The lighting is dark and oppressive. Um, There's always smoking, because smoking looks cool and looks really cool with a black and white harsh lighting. Um, main characters, the main uh, investigator, he's always got some skeleton in his closet that he's struggling with. The past is impacting how our character is moving now. Um, and then, just like uh, we talked about the Rube Goldberg device, there's almost a Rude Goldberg story structure in film noir where um, there's an overly complex plot that the bad guys are usually trying to do. Um, and then it's always urban. It's always in the middle of a metropolis city. And then oftentimes film noir end with a bleak view of humanity. The bad guys win. Is there justice on earth? No. Um, and that brings us back to what all genres are trying to answer the question of, will there be justice? Every genre has an approach to this. So let's go through them. Drama. Drama is the easiest uh, to decipher. And that's simply, yeah, can we find justice? Will justice show up in the end of the story? The question for horror is more, the world is unjust. But maybe there's justice on the other side. Maybe in the afterlife, we'll find justice. And this is mostly for supernatural horror. Um, but horror actually, uh, a lot of times in Christian communities, rightfully so, because they're bloody and they're gratuitous, and usually there's a lot of sexual activity in horror movies. But at the same time, uh, horror movies fixate on death, which a lot of times secular society tries to deny death. So horror has this interesting uh, perspective of focusing on death and trying to work with it. Um, so action films. Action films say, okay, is there justice in the world? Yes, there is justice through might. We can overcome the injustice of the world through amazing action feats and amazing car chases um, and amazing plot lines. All right, comedies. Now, there's kind of two types of comedies. There's what I'm going to call the bingeable comedy, right? Like The Office. Uh, you watch five episodes in a row, and it's all set in uh, the workplace environment where you know all the characters. Um, and the bingeable comedy says... The world is normal and therefore good. So the unjust things that happen are normal. And eventually they're going to work out. Because overall the world is good. 
bingeable comedies, the guy always eventually, by season four or five, ends up with the girl. Now, the other side of this is the dark comedy that says, okay, injustice is funny. So the world is unjust, and the way we should respond to that is by laughing at it. Romance. Romance, love conquers all, which will eventually include death itself. Or, flip of that, uh, the sad romance, love doesn't conquer all. And therefore, the world is unjust. So love conquers all, therefore, uh, love conquers injustice. Or the sad version, the tragic romance, love isn't enough. All right. And the last and most consistent version we see nowadays are sequels. All right. So the sequel is interesting. Um... Because I think we are conditioned by our own human nature, um, and to a certain extent the true nature of reality, to love sequels. Why? Because the story never ends. We get to the ending, and then the ending sets up the next one. It's a domino. So sequels allow for brokenness after the happy ending. You get some happiness, but then you also get, but wait. Um, and this feels true, right? We get married to the love of our life. But wait, we still are going to have struggles in our marriage. We're still going to have fights. We're still going to have some version of conflict even after our marriage. Sequels in the same way. You defeat the bad guy, but now a new bad guy is arising. Or that bad guy is going to come back and have his vengeance in the next movie. All right, so how do these genres that make us feel so comfortable and feel so safe while we're watching them how do they impact our narratives about reality and eventually our worldview? So I want to look at a few little heresies. The first one I already kind of mentioned, and that's might makes right. Winning is the only way to win and defeat uh, injustice. The good guys win by being stronger. Um... Sometimes this shows up in the form of being uh, morally more perfect, and the morally more perfect one is the one that ends up being right. Um, we win when we're the most righteous, um, but we become the most righteous by being smarter or by being braver or by being stronger. Um, so I gave the example here of Dr. Strange. Maybe I should have gone more classic, um, but I went with Dr. Strange because Dr. Strange... I feel like someone would come back to me and say, might doesn't always make right. Doctor Strange isn't the strongest superhero, yet he keeps winning. Um, but in that, he's the cleverest, right? So his cleverness makes right. Um, action films and uh, superhero stories tend to tell us that human or the way of the world, the, our worldview should be that the good guys in the end will have better capabilities than the bad guys. The good guys are stronger or the good guys are cleverer, and that's why they're going to win. Um, so you can kind of, when you think about that long enough, it sniffs of kind of arrogance um, that, okay, the world's always going to work out because the, the people who are the strongest are going to be the best. Hmm. Doesn't sound right. Um, a spinoff on this is we see it less now. We've kind of gotten better with this, but traditionally, like the villain is always ugly, right? He's got a scar. In the Lion King, he literally has a scar. So the good guys are also the more beautiful ones. Hmm. So it's not really a good theology, right? Uh, win through being stronger? Mm -mm, not great. Um, Another form of this that we see a lot of times in drama is that authenticity makes right. Or authenticity will take us to paradise. Auth by being authentic, we will become who we were always meant to be. In justice terms, we would say something like, find yourself, find your true self, or be true to yourself, and you'll be able to rise above injustice. Uh, 
Um, I, I got the screenshot from A Star Is Born, but I really just wanted a, a shot of Lady Gaga because uh, she has the song Born Like This, which the lyrics read, it doesn't matter if you love him or capital H-I-M, just put your paws up because you were born this way, baby. My mama told me when I was young, we were all born superstars. She rolled my hair and put my lipstick on in the glass of her boudoir. There's nothing wrong with loving who you are, she said. Because he made you perfect, babe. So hold your head up, girl, and you'll go far. Listen to me when I say, I'm beautiful in my way. Because God makes no mistakes. I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. Don't hide yourself in regret. Just love yourself and you're set. I'm on the right track, baby. I was born this way. <sighs> so, there's a lot that's correct there, right? Right? I don't think God makes mistakes, and God does make us um, beautiful, however he's made us. But a lot of times, then we take that back to be like, okay, the sinful aspects of my personality now is me being authentic and therefore me um, reflecting the image of God. And that's not always the case. Sometimes some of the things that we say we're born with are just things that are sinful in us because um, we're also born broken um, and in a sinful world, right? But especially in storytelling, this idea of you have to escape from what the world wants you to be and be true to yourself. This like inner soul conscious um, is a certain subtext that flows through a lot of stories. All right, next one maybe is a little harder to explain, but it's simply that you can rise up to be the good guy. Um, what I've seen in this life is that we all struggle with an inner false belief. And that false belief says something like, I'm good enough. I'm a good boy and that's why I'm right. And that's why God saved me. Um, so before this job, I worked as a teacher in a state prison in Oregon. Um, roughly 70% of my students were in jail for sexual crimes. Uh, many of them, many of those crimes were, were too heinous. Uh, for me to recount here, um, they did horrible things. Um, now, I've always known that there are, quote, bad people in this world, right? But when, you, when I started reading the reports of these people, and then I had to look them in the eye as I taught them in class, um, it, it was a completely different experience entirely for me. Um, and uh, making matters a little worse, we also had tutors in our classes, so the tutors were like teacher's aides, except the tutors were also inmates. Um, and over time, just naturally, since the, the tutors are working with you, you tend to treat your tutors more like um, fellow, fellow co-workers. Um, and there was one, in, uh, one inmate, one tutor in particular, that I just had a natural bond with. Uh, he would bring in theology books every day, and we would talk about different theo theological theories. Um, and I just had uh, a lot of joy in talking with him and talking theology nerd stuff. Um, and uh, when I first met him, I didn't know his background story. I didn't know why he was in prison or any of that. Um, and then one day, a fellow teacher told me, um, this guy raped and murdered his next door neighbor. Um, and then every day after that, after learning that information, I just wanted to go to him and just ask, like, how and why? Why could you do such a horrible thing? How could you do that? Um, and it, it, it got harder and harder for me to look him in the eyes um, because every time I looked him in the eyes, I just started to think about the story. Um, and it was a big story, uh, I guess, in the local news at the time. Um, so there's a lot of footage of his court, his trial, and a lot of uh, newspaper stories on him that I could easily have access to. Um, and yeah, this he, he was the nicest guy on earth right now. Um, but there's no taking back from what he'd done. The damage is done. He he killed those. He killed that person, um, and that's final. Death won in that situation. He stole another life. More than that, he shattered the lives of all the people around his victim. Um, and so over time, 
interacting with all these people that have done really horrible things, this overwhelming sensation started to come over me, pour over me. And it was just, there, there's so many of them. There's so many of these bad people. Um, and I tell this to say that as I encountered them, all these, all these folks, I started to look at my own sin and think like, oh, I'm not that bad. Dante, you're not that bad. You didn't kill anybody. Um, I began to compare myself and think, okay, I, I'm not that bad. I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, I'm a good boy, and that's why I'm okay, and God's going to save me, and God's kind and good and gracious to me um, because I'm not as bad as those guys. <sighs> Doesn't really work. Um, that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel at all. Um, so a lot of times I think we have this mindset of, and, and it comes through in stories that our bad things aren't that bad and we can reach salvation by being good enough. Works-based salvation, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. The long way to trying to say that. Um, so another, another form of heresy is the MacGuffin, again. Yay! We keep talking about the MacGuffin, that thing that all the characters in the story care too much about. Um, and I think the heresy here is that the password makes right, or I can overcome injustice with the right password or the right piece of knowledge. I said this before, if we concentrate only on being saved, that's sometimes our MacGuffin in Christian storytelling, then we turn Christianity into a formula or an idol or an end before the end itself. This grabbing of the MacGuffin is so common in media all over the place. Um, and it's this idea of being more moral and you'll win the kingdom. Be braver, be smarter, smarter, and you'll win eternal life for yourself. This idea of achieving a password, of overcoming our obstacle, of grabbing that MacGuffin, can easily become our MacGuffin or our immortality project. It's the idea that the password is the answer. Um, and this, this takes us to a very real heresy, and that, uh, that being Gnosticism. So Gnosticism was a heresy that infected the early church first few hundred years of his, its existence. Um, so it was uh, kind of brought to the surface by this guy who went by the name of Marcion, Marcion of Sinope. And Marcion... Uh, looked at the Old Testament, looked at the New Testament, or at least um, writings of the New Testament, and said, okay, I can't, I can't see how the God of the Old Testament is the same God that Jesus proclaims. The God of the Old Testament is really uh, vindictive, uh, and the God of the New Testament is all about grace and love. So these two things just can't compile. Marcion didn't see a way for the Old and New Testaments to be compatible. He didn't see the same God in them. So he said, they must be different gods. And then over time, this turned into a division where Gnostics or Gnostic believers said, the spirit inside of us is what's holy and perfect. My body and the physical world around me is evil. So they elevated spiritualism and they denigrated uh, naturalism or the natural world. Um, and they also said the God of the Old Testament is a different God. Marcion called him Yaldaba Oath than the God of the New Testament. Um, so he essentially said Jesus and Yahweh are two different gods. Um, and this heresy of saying... Uh, the physical world is evil, while the spiritual world is wholly good, is an ongoing heresy that we often get mixed up in, um, in our stories and even in our Christianity today. The popular band Arcade Fire put out a song a few years ago called My Body is a Cage. Uh, and it reads, the lyrics read, My body is a cage that keeps me from dancing with the one I love, but my mind holds the key. I'm living in an age that calls darkness light, though my language is dead, still the shapes fill my head. 
My body is a cage. We take what we're given just because you've forgotten. That doesn't mean you're forgiven. I'm living in an age that screams my name at night, but when I get to the doorway, there's no one in sight. I'm living in an age that laughs when I'm dancing with the one I love, but my mind holds the key. You're standing next to me. My mind holds the key. Set my spirit free. Set my spirit free. Set my spirit free. Um, unless you think this is something that only non-Christians deal with, we, of course, have uh, songs and hymns like I'll Fly Away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. Um, not saying the song is heretical, um, but it does kind of walk the line of saying the physical world is all evil. I need to divorce myself from it. Uh, another hymn, The World Is Not My Home, kind of has that same uh, drum rhythm to it. <sighs> okay. Uh, I'd like to whisper uh, a mystery to you. Um, yes, you need to ask for Jesus to enter your heart. Yes, you need to repent of your sins. Yes, you must stop sinning. And yet, grace is unearned. But grace is not good storytelling. Why? Because it's unjust. We don't deserve it. So how can grace be just? I, I don't think it is. Uh, Philippians 3, 4 through 11, Paul says this, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying, I didn't earn this. There's nothing I could do to get here. Um, Paul's story, right, is... Uh, he's a bad guy, then converted... By Jesus. Jesus had to show up uh, in front of him to change Paul around. Um, and even then, I'm not saying this wrong, but Paul had his own MacGuffin, right? He had something that he valued very much. And he thought, my witness, my, uh, my purpose here on earth to bring the kingdom of heaven here is to take the gospel to Spain. But he never does. God doesn't even get him there. Death gets Paul before he can ever get to Spain. Obviously, Christ uses uh, Paul's testimony and his writings far beyond, I'm sure, what Paul ever imagined, um, that we're devouring his words every day in the church pews and in our own time of testimony and meditation with God um, in our Bibles. But all that to say, um, there's something difficult and tricky about Christian storytelling because for us, our hope, faith, and love is built on grace, which, again, just like eternity, isn't really good storytelling. All right. So once we've identified all these genres, some interesting things have happened with storytellers um, in the last several decades. Um, first, deconstruction. So there's been several people in several different time periods where 
uh, filmmakers and novelists have said, okay, this is the structure of genre. I want to deconstruct it. I want to tear off the layers of what the audience is expecting. Uh, so this led in superheroes, I think mostly started in the 80s, to the rise of the anti-hero. Uh, we see this reach, I think it's climax, uh, last year with the popularity of the Joker movie, right? What are we watching when we're watching Joker? We're watching the deconstruction of heroes and really we're rebuilding that precipice based off of of horrible morals. Like what if we built a superhero not on good things but on bad things? Here's the Joker. Um, but deconstruction is helpful too because as we deconstruct our genres, uh, we can then reconstruct them in a way that I think uh, propels a Christian story to have influence. Um, one comic book series that I absolutely love is called Astro City. And it reconstructs uh, superhero stories, but focuses in on everyday lives and focuses in even in the everyday parts of superheroes' lives, uh, which uh, makes it feel very real and very pedestrian. So rather than focusing on, you know, Superman uh, fighting intergalactic warriors, you might still have Superman, but now you're also dealing, uh, you're focusing in Astro City on what, is, what does Superman dream about? Um, in the first episode of Astro City, their version of Superman, uh, he's so busy flying to places all day long, flying to save people, that he never gets to fly for fun. And so when he falls asleep every night, he dreams about flying around for fun's sake, just being free in flying around. But he never has the opportunity because every day he wakes up and he's got this busy schedule of trying to save people and he's flying with purpose. Um, so it really humanizes him and helps us see the pain even in being a uh, superhero or supernatural uh, being. All right, faith, hope, and love. So if we're creating a Christian story, maybe we impose, at least in the end, these three principles. So love. Love is incredible. Love is really difficult to talk about because it's hard to pinpoint, and a lot of times we see uh, perverted forms of love. Uh, C.S. Lewis, of course, had wrote about the four loves. Um, and society has lust and thinks lust is love. Uh, our Bibles, the old King James translation, uh, says charity instead of love. Um, so love is twisted and mucked, mucked up. Um, and I think just like uh, the end of our story that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians, we can only see love through a mirror dimly. Um, so, what if we created a story where love is our first act? Act one is built on love. Remember, God is love and God created the world. So love is our first act. Our second act is about faith. Faith is reaching the goal. We're working through our goal. Uh, Hebrews 12 right, uh, is the, the faith hall of fame and all those characters uh, that the writer of Hebrews mentions where they were hall of fame faith servants of God. Um, that's the middle of the story where you're, you're striving to your goal based on faith that the end will be happy. And then the third act should be hope, I think, in our stories because we're in this inaugurated kingdom. We still hope. We've completed our part, um, however we've been led. But we're not to eternity yet. So our stories can end on a third act of hope rather than a happily ever after. Um, eternity gets to be our fourth act. So we're in the third act now. Eternity will be our fourth act. And we can't conceive of it. Um, but we know from Revelation 21.5 he who is seated on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. So until that fourth act, we have to live with this reality. This reality um, 
that God will make our stories new. But until then, the way we can understand story is that story is conflict, story is tension, story is pain, and story is not knowing if justice will be found in any one given situation. For me, this is a great comfort. I fear death. Um, maybe that's weakness on my point, right? Uh, but I do, uh, at least the process of dying. Um, however, death also lets me know something. It lets me know that the world is broken, and I need to keep repeating that to myself until I believe it. Uh, the world is broken. The world is broken. Uh, and we need a Savior to help us through. We need someone uh, to break through that brokenness. We need a Savior who doesn't win by the usual rules of might makes right or finding a password that will be the MacGuffin key. That would just be another superhero. We don't need that. We need someone who will change everything. Even in the way we process reality, um, we need a, a different type of Savior. And this, this makes me desperate. Uh, I say of myself, I am a desperate believer in Jesus uh, because I am that. Uh, if I wasn't, then I could find myself seduced by a false narrative, one that says, I don't need Jesus. Uh, remember when Jesus uh, gave the, the sermon about eating him because he's the bread of life and a bunch of his followers leave him. But, and Jesus turns to Peter and says, are you going to leave too? And Peter just says, I got nowhere else to go. I'm with you. We need to be reliant on Jesus and reliant on the grace that will transcend story. And we need a fourth act that's better and bigger than our dreams of happily ever after. We need hunger. We need to hunger and thirst for it. We're in the now, but not yet part of the story. I need you, Jesus. And as the close of the biblical story ends in Revelation 20, 20, or 22, 20, amen, come quickly, Lord Jesus.